Good morning and welcome to the webinar Heat and Air Pollution in the Nordic Context, where we will, be, we will present results from the project Exhaustion. Uh, my name is Gunal Sandanga and I work as a Senior Communications Advisor at CICERO, Center for International Climate Research. This session is recorded so that we can send the recording to people who want to see the webinar uh, afterwards. And uh, we also have, we'll have a Q&A session in the end of the webinar. So please think through questions that you would like to ask. And you can also ask questions in the Q&A function during the webinar. And we really recommend you or uh, think it's a good thing if you ask a question because this is a complicated material for some of us. And it's re really appreciated if you ask clarifying questions. So do not hesitate to just ask questions in the Q&A. Um, and the first presenter today is Christine Auna, which is a research director at CICERO. And she also leads the project and consortium, EU project and consortium exhaustion. She's also leading the climate and health consortium and uh, from CICERO. So please, Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thank you, can I? Oh, let me see if I can share the right screen here. Is this the correct one? Okay, uh, so uh, again, welcome everyone um, to this seminar on heat and air pollution in the Nordic context. It may sound a bit strange to talk about heat these days, at least in Oslo, we have minus 12 degrees. But um, that doesn't mean that. Um, is that... There. Yeah. So, uh, the background I will say a few words about the background for this exhaustion project and uh, some of the main picture of what we are investigating in this exhaustion project. And the um, background is, uh, of course, um, global warming. Um, that is. Um, going on. So according to the IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report, we are heading for a global warming <clears throat> well above the target set out in the Paris Agreement. With the current pledges, we are heading for 2.4 degrees global warming. And um, but the, the pledges uh, doesn't necessarily uh, will be realized. So if you look at the actual policies, we are heading for 2.7 degrees global warming. Uh, so what about Europe? Uh, according to the same report, IPCC assessment report, <clears throat> regardless of future levels of global warming, temperatures will rise in all European areas at the rate exceeding global mean temperature changes. And this is similar to past observations. And the figure in, in the corner here shows um, the uh, global temperature increase since um, 18, uh, since pre-industrial times up to now. And globally, it's now 1.2. And in Europe, it's actually much larger, 2.2. And the further north we go, the stronger is the warming. So in the Arctic, it's actually uh, already warming up three degrees. And this means also that the frequency and intensity of hot extremes have increased in recent decades and are pro projected to keep increasing regardless of the greenhouse gas emission scenario until a certain time of one. So this means that critical thresholds relevant for ecosystems and humans are projected to uh, be exceeded for global warming above two degrees. Uh, the frequency of cold spells and frost days will decrease according to the report under all the greenhouse gas emission scenarios. So uh, that is the background of this uh, exhaustion project, uh, where we aim at looking into what this means for Europe. Uh, so there are basically two things, um, two main reasons why heat waves is a growing concern for health and well-being um, of the Europeans. And uh, one thing is that, um, uh, Europe has seen a particularly strong increase in heat, heat extremes the last two decades. Um, um, and um, for instance, we had in 2003 a very strong heat wave that hit a large part of uh, Europe, or at least uh, the middle part, or central part, southern part. 
with an estimated 70,000 premature deaths, mainly in France and Italy and Spain. And since uh, then, there have been several very strong heat waves uh, hitting uh, different parts of uh, the Europe. Um, maybe you remember last summer, uh, uh, they recorded 40 degrees Celsius in London, which was a record. And um, according to uh, scientists, without human caused climate change, this temperature of 40 degrees in the UK would have been extremely unlikely. Uh, there are different theories and studies of why global warming is faster at the European continent. Uh, one paper last year, or was it this year, um, did some study indicating maybe it has to do with um, the jet stream. I will not go into the detail there, but uh, um, the conclusion for this study is that uh, Europe may be a heat wave hotspot because uh, it seems that uh, it's exhibiting upward trends that are three to four times faster compared to the rest of the northern mid-latitude over the last decade. So this is very worrisome. Ex uh, heat, um, heat extremes are increasing more rapidly. The other main reason why we are concerned in Europe is that we have an aging pro uh, population. And this means basically that we have a population that are more vulnerable to heat stress and other kinds of environmental stressors as well. Um, I show here, uh, um, cardiovascular disease is an important endpoint. Uh, cardi cardiovascular and respiratory diseases seem to be very sensitive to uh, heat stress. And uh, there's a large share of, the, of the deaths in Europe already caused by cardiovascular disease, 60% in Eastern Europe. 52% in Central Europe and uh, somewhat less in Western Europe. So um, this means that if I can just go back to there. Um, so this is um, the backdrop of this exhaustion project where we aim to investigate for European populations um, how temperature impacts the mortality. And we look particularly at uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases. And we also look into what are the benefits of mitigation and how can we adapt to increased uh, heat stress. Um, today, we will hear from uh, two, two, three of the partners. Uh, it's a big consortium with uh, several partners across Europe. But today we have, uh, as you know, uh, people from uh, three of uh, these institutions that are part of our uh, consortium. Um, I will not go into detail. This is a complicated figure, but it also shows the complexity of uh, this project. Um, and of course, the interdisciplinary col collaboration is extremely important. So we have a group of epidemiologists that are looking into these uh, exposure response curves for temperature uh, and versus uh, risk of mortality and hospitalization to some extent. Um, and we have a group of uh, climate and air pollution modelers who um, look into the or uh, investigate how this has developed in the past and how um, different emission scenarios might result in uh, increasing temperatures and air pollution. Um, so air pollution is also an important part of what we want to look into. And uh, as we will hear later today uh, in the seminar, we'll also learn about this, uh, the wildfire and how they contribute. Uh, we have a group of people looking into uh, the, or combining uh, the information from the epidemiological studies and the climate and air pollution modeling to do health impact assessment. So that's basically estimating the health burden from, uh, from these stressors. And we also look into socioeconomic consequences. And we have a large group of people uh, dealing with dissemination, exploitation, and communication activities. So it's a very diverse uh, project. As I say, um, the link to, between climate change and air pollution is an important part of exhaustion. And um, uh, this figure shows some of the main linkages. So first of all, it's to a large extent the same sources of emissions of air pollution and greenhouse gases. And uh, whereas um, greenhouse gases leads to increasing temperatures and incre increasing strength and, and the magnitude, etc., of the heat waves, these heat waves can also have an impact on air pollution. 
through very many different, different uh, complex mechanisms that I will not go into. But the point is that uh, we see that uh, there is an increased risk of uh, or higher levels of uh, air pollution, ground level air pollution. So ozone is one important uh, air pollutant that is uh, damaging to health and particulate matter pollution is also affected by heat waves. Um, and then another important link between climate change and uh, air pollution is the fact that when you have heat waves and maybe combined with droughts, there's an increased risk of wildfire, which leads to large emissions of, of uh, air pollution. Um, uh, we will hear more from this later, but just to give you a flavor of what we are doing in uh, exhaustion. Um, so we are looking at um, the dose response functions for temperature and um, mortality and other uh, these uh, endpoints or hospitalization. But we also want to see uh, what to investigate to what extent um, combined exposure to heat stress and air pollution has a larger effect. And um, in brief, for Europe as a whole, this is this figure shows the results of a meta analysis of all the cities included in one part of the study. And it basically shows that um, that uh, heat stress uh, or the impact of heat stress gets worse when you are also uh, exposed to high levels of air pollution. Um, this uh, last figure is uh, also an indicator of why we are interested in wildfires. Um, and we will hear more about that later. But uh, this, is, uh, this figure basically shows that um, there is an increasing contribution uh, from wildfires to air pollution over Europe. And um, while levels are still low uh, when it comes to wildfire emissions, this could mean that uh, it gets harder to reach air quality targets. Um, population exposure to air pollution in Europe has gone down due to very many efficient policies, but uh, the red line up, uh, below here uh, indicates that uh, this is now being counteracted by increasing emissions and contribution to air pollution from wildfires. So this is of a concern. So I will end there. And um, as you know, we, uh, we will hear uh, more about this project, uh, Air Pollution at the Global Scale by Lisa Honinen, and we'll learn about Nordic Air Pollution Projection. And we'll hear more about the health impact assessment, uh, results from Norway. Um, and then finally, we will hear from uh, Katrina Rojaki and Red Cross on extreme temperature preparedness, lessons for actions in the Nordic. Thank you. Thank you, Kristin. And this is just a reminder to the attendees that you can ask questions in the Q&A. And now the next uh, researcher is, that we present uh, is Risto Hanena. He is a researcher at the Finnish Meteorological Institute, and he will give us some an introduction about air pollution on a global scale. The floor is yours, Risto. Thank you. Uh, just a moment. I hope you can now see the screen. Yeah. So, so thanks for invitation. Uh, I will concentrate on, on the global scale, even if the topic of, of the of the of the webinar is, is Nordic scale. Uh, we always need some boundary conditions for these uh, air pollutants when we go to the smaller scales. Therefore, we uh, first typically start with a global scale air pollutant pollution situation and then go to the smaller scale using the global scale results as the boundary conditions for 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 for, for making the simulations at the smaller scale so so this is a contribution from several people from the Finnish Meteorological Institute uh, I'm mostly responsible for this uh, these calculations where we simulate these air pollutants this is short outline of the talk. Uh, uh, I will first make a short introduction and, and, and then uh, describe how the model performs and then 
look at these historical and future air pollutant levels at the, at the global scale. So uh, uh, I'm concentrating on this kind of uh, SILA model that uh, describes the transport of air pollutants in, in air. So it, it, uh, this kind of model typically takes as an input the, the emissions uh, that are either anthropogenic uh, or, or natural, like, uh, like uh, dust or, or pipe fires or, or sea salt. Uh, or, or natural biogenic emissions from trees and so so on. Uh, it only it doesn't only describe the transport. It also includes the chemistry that is uh, describes the uh, transformation of, of uh, chemicals to other other chemicals. Uh, the global model, of course, has to go high in in altitude. It, it, it includes the stratosphere. And, and the model includes the CFC gases. For example, you can you can correctly see that uh, the the pan of these CFC gases uh, this uh, has helped uh, to to um, revise these uh, ozone levels at the, at the Antarctic. So there's no ozone such a big ozone hole anymore. It's it's recovering. Uh, the model also includes a new fire forecasting model that uh, that estimates the fire uh, emissions from fire fires, uh, especially PM particular matter for fine particles, uh, and the runs that I, I'm, I'm doing are uh, the historical ones. They they typically use this kind of meteorology that this is is a real meteor, but uh, for 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 comparison, we have also this kind of uh, uh, climatological meteorology, which is called SESM, uh, that is also used for these future scenarios. So it, this kind of meteor models that uh, they, they have same statistics and a similar behavior than the, than the real meteorology, but of course, for, for future, we cannot have the real meteor, but we have, we have to have some some meteor that is, 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 is describing the possible meteor in the future. So I'm, I'm using three kind of uh, scenarios for these runs, uh, for, for meteor and also for emissions. For example, uh, there's this green, green pathway that is somehow supposed to keep the uh, uh, heating to this 1.5 degrees, close, at least close to that. That's this uh, SSP1, to six level, uh, scenario that uh, on the right top figure, you can see that the C, uh, carbon dioxide levels don't increase so much in, in the future anymore. And then there's middle, scale, middle of the road scenario, this SSP two for five, uh, that uh, is some kind of uh, middle of the road. And then there's this uh, worst case scenario that we are considering is this SSP three, 70 uh, that is at least in, in, in currently it's it seems that we, we are still on, on, on that pathway. The lower level lower figure shows the predicted uh, methane concentrations for these three, three different scenarios. So the, the global runs are, of course, they, they are a bit more coarse in resolution than, than, the, than the more detailed ones. So there are two degree runs that cover something like 150 years. And this is, this is the PICU that we are, where we are trying to see how well the model performs. Uh, we have compared the atomic optical depth that somehow describes the, um, it measures the aerosols in, in air. For example, urban haze, smoke, particles, desert dust, or sea salt. So the, in, in a clear sky, this kind of, this uh, optical depth is, is something like 0.1. And if it's it's uh, at one, it's, it's, it's a very hazy condition. So you can see that in, in, when, when there's a lo lot of smoke in, in air or, or desert dust storms. And on the left figure describes the bias, bias that is somehow describes the mean difference from the measurements. That's not only measure that we should have a look at it. So uh, the right figure indicates the correlation. Uh, 
uh, where this uh, it describes how well the model follows the measurements. And, and in that scale, the one is this 100% agreement. Uh, this is a comparison in Europe where the uh, measurement stations are quite dense. Uh, the, this is a, we are, I'm comparing the, the ozone, ozone levels. This is one year comparison. Uh, it, it indicates that uh, we have, uh, we are, the model sl slightly overestimates ozone on average, but uh, in many places it's, it's uh, quite unbiased. And uh, the correlation with, with ozone is, is rather good on the, that, that, that is seen on the right, right figure. Uh, and this, this uh, similar comparison with the uh, particular matter, fine particles, PM2.5. Uh, left figure is again the PS. We are slightly underestimating the, the fine particles, but the correlation is still rather good. So it's, it might uh, seem that it's the number is not so high, but uh, typically the models which have correlation that is point five or point six, it's considered as rather, rather, rather good. Uh, then I will go to this kind of uh, historical uh, development of these air pollutants. Uh, the, this is the, with the this realic, realistic, real, real meteor. This shows the ozone development during the last uh, for decades, there is not extremely large variations. They are actually the, they are rather small. You can see mostly the Middle East increase of the ozone at the at the, at the, at the right lower figure. But if you if you look at the look at the nitrogen nitrogen dioxide, that is one other pollutant, uh, and uh, you will look at the levels in, for example. In, in Europe and US, you can see that uh, this kind of uh, improvements in, 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 for example, emissions of cars and so on uh, have improved the uh, air quality on that sense, in, especially in US and in Europe. But for example, in, in China, these levels have been increased during the last four, four, four decades. This is fine particles. Uh, of course, I can emphasize that as, as in the previous figure and this figure, the, the scale is logarithmic. So the blue 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 color is, is uh, it's uh, four, four decades smaller than, 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 the, than the red red color. For example, uh, and between uh, yellow and, and red, the, the decrease is tenfold. Uh, Fine particles. The, the the difference is not not extremely large in in in, in the during these uh, four decades, but uh, you can see some 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 changes there. The, the one reason is that uh, especially in Africa, it's this uh, desert dust that, that is is, is uh, showing this uh, high levels that uh, have not changed so much. But you can especially see the the increasing population and increasing developments in uh, India where the PM, PM levels have been increasing. This is fine particles from, from uh, fires. Also during these four decades, there's not extremely large variations, but you can see some incre increase in, in uh, Western coast of Northern America. And uh, for example, uh, Siberia, the R Russia region, the, the fires have been becoming more, more and more common. But uh, you can see a bit more variation if you if you look at these uh, long, longer periods. For example, the, the, the top row here shows the historical part with the CES meteor. Uh, uh, here you can see that the ozone has been uh, lower in, in the 1950s than compared to, to present days. Uh, but uh, then these uh, three lower rows of figures show the development of, 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 the, of the levels in the future scenarios. The second row is, is the green scenario, the, lo the lowest pollution scenario. Middle is, uh, the second lowest row is the middle, middle row of the road scenario. And, and, and the bottom is, is the 
uh, uh, is the worst case scenario. So you can see clearly between these uh, three scenarios that end of the century on, on the right, uh, the, the ozone levels are much higher with the worst case scenario compared to this clean, clean scenario. And, 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 and they are, this clean scenario is having, having a similar levels than and, and in the 1950s. Uh, this is a similar figure for, for nitrogen dioxide. You can uh, especially see the, so the increase in, in the history from the 1950s to, to present day or uh, 2000 or 2009. And you can see the, the differences in the different scenarios, how, 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 how the pollution should develop. You can also here see the contribution from shipping on the seaside. This is the fine particles, uh, similar, similar figure. Uh, the, here you can especially, for example, between these scenarios, you can see, for example, uh, the differences in, 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 in India or, or, or China, how, how, how the different, uh, three different scenarios differ at the end of the century. And also you can see that uh, currently the situation is, is, uh, is already quite bad in, 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 in those, those regions. Uh, this is uh, from fires. Uh, uh, you, ca you can see that uh, during the history, there's no much changes, but uh, if, you, if you look at, the, look at the situation at the end of the century, the three uh, lowest figures on the right, uh, you can see a clear, clear difference between these scenarios. So there, there's uh, much more fires on the Northern, Northern America, especially in Canada. Uh, Australia or, or Siberia compared to the clean scale, clean scale scenario the, of the SSP 126. One, uh, just uh, uh, zoom up for these two different uh, cases for this worst case scenario and, 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 and begin of the century for this uh, fire PM emissions. So you can see clearly that. Uh, how the model predicts much more fires in the in the Canadian region uh, or South America and, and, uh, and Australia and Siberia. There's no there's some differences also in Europe, but uh, they are mostly in, in the east eastern southern part of the Europe. So uh, I hope I uh, gave you some hints how the air pollutant levels in, in, the, in the future and in the historic have been developed. Thank you, Risto. I have a question from a lay person. Maybe you answered it a bit towards the end, but there have been some ma major fire events the last years, like in Canada and also the tropical forests have, uh, Amazonas, for example, have experienced a lot of uh, wildfires uh, the last years. Is this how is this reflected in the models, or is this something we can, uh, we can yeah we can see? Uh, we can see something. Of course, uh, the model is not not perfect. It's it's the model is 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 using only meteorological parameters to to pre predict the fires. So it 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 is learned by by using the satellite measurements of the fires in the history. It's it's learned by by make, making this fifteen years of satellite measurements. And then, uh, compare, then the eval it's evaluated by using the last five years, and and then it, it it's uh, the model performs almost as, as good as, as the, this kind of uh, near real time prediction for for the fires. Uh, but of course, it's uh, there's uh, the model cannot uh, d describe how the people might behave in the future. That that's of course that's not in, 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 the, in the model. So if, if people start doing some uh, measurements against the fires, th th that's, that's not included in the, in the model, unless it's, it's somehow uh, related to this kind of uh, historical behavior. And uh, you also said that the 
uh, fire forecasting that uh, models were new. So could you say a little bit or explain what does it show that uh, compared to other models or um, uh, 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 I cannot, there's typically the fire forecast models don't, uh, they are not very good. Uh, also here, the, the, the correlation is, is also not very high. It's something like 0.3 or so, depending on, on the region. Uh, but uh, uh, how, how should I put it in? Uh, the model can only predict the fires in a large, large area, so it, it cannot it cannot pinpoint some specific points, but it can it can predict the fires in, in, a, in a, for example, 200 by 200 kilometer regions that the probability of the fire is increasing or decreasing. Uh, it, uh, so I, I hope I answered the question somehow. Yeah, thank you. And I think also the next presentation is uh, presentation from Ulesh on Nordic air pollution projections. Uh, we'll touch upon some of the same issues. So please, Ulesh, give a go ahead. You are a senior scientist at Aarhus University at the Department on Environmental Science in Denmark. And uh, you are working on air pollution and climate modeling at the global and regional scale. Um, yeah, that's true. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk in this. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Yes, so I, I'll pick up uh, from where Risto left. So he was referring to uh, global scale pollution. I will take it down and zoom over a bit Europe and the Nordic uh, region. Uh, this is a study in, in, in frame of the exhaustion project with many uh, people from Aarhus University, but in this talk, I'll also uh, use data from FMI, from Risto and Mikhail Sofiev, the, the fire emissions and the SILAM uh, global simulations that Risto has just mentioned as an input to the regional models. Uh, so uh, this is my um, outlook. I will uh, talk very really briefly about objectives and of the project and downscaling experiments. Uh, the model description very briefly, how good the models are. Uh, Risto already touched a bit on this. Uh, and then I will more mostly speak on European ozone and fine, fine particle, particulate matter projections. And then in a similar way, the Nordic uh, projections and then see conclusions. So among many objectives of the project, uh, one objective is uh, to, to estimate the impacts of extreme heat and air pollution on cardiopulmonary diseases and premature mortality in, in Europe. Um, and uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on air pollution and by air pollution, what, we, what I will refer mainly is uh, fine particulate matter and, and ozone. Uh, these are the major focus also in the in the in the project because they have very well established uh, literature and epidemiological studies showing the impacts on many mortality and morbidity and points uh, on human health. Um, particulate matter uh, can be directly emitted from different sources, uh, anthropogenic or natural, like dust or sea salt. Ozone is a secondary pollutant, so we cannot emit ozone. It is later created in the atmosphere um, by, by chemical reactions. And it, it, it is a component with temperature, so it's very well tied to temperature. So in, in practice, we can say that if you have increasing temperatures, you will most likely have increasing ozone uh, concentrations. But this is, this is too general, of course. Uh, and what we do in, in exhaustion is that we use uh, first we, we we project the global climate using the community Earth system model uh, that Risto also mentioned, and then we use a multi-model approach to downscale these projections of climate air pollution in Europe uh, until a uh, frame of 2050. And why we use a multi-model approach is because uh, 
models are developed in different ways, the different groups, they have different complexities uh, or assumptions in the physics, dynamics, or the chemistries. Uh, so they, they, they gave a slightly, or to some extent, sometimes large different snapshots of the, of the atmosphere. Uh, the state, the chemistry, or the methodology. Uh, so, uh, relying on one model can can, uh, can end up with uh, being high or low biased uh, compared to what the reality is. So, we try to reduce this uncertainty using a different uh, number of models, which we call multimodal ensembles. Um, so, we we try to kind of have a, a estimate of the reliability from model to model and how much we can trust this uh, projection or um, the levels that we present. So in exhaustion, we use three models to do that, uh, uh, but uh, the project is ongoing. So in my talk, I will only uh, mention one uh, of the models, the, the model that uh, we use in Denmark. I'll come to that. Uh, so my talk is about the future. Uh, so what we did do in exhaustion is that we get the IPCC or, or the couple, uh, coupled model inter comparison project that fits IPCC actually emissions um, uh, from different scenarios uh, that Risto already mentioned. And here I, I highlight uh, for the different um, pollutants with the red bar, what happens in Europe according to CMIP-6 or IPCC in 2050 and 2100. Uh, and when you focus on Europe, what, what you all need to know, this is a busy figure, but blue is a decrease and reddish is an increase. So when you look at all the columns that corresponds to Europe, you can see that all pollutants are projected to decrease in, in Europe. This is, for example, may not be the case in Asia or India where we expect increases uh, in some pollutants. So um, what we used is the Danish Learning Hemispheric Model or the DAME model that is developed at Aarhus University. Um, we use the three future scenarios that Risto pre presented. Uh, for simplicity, I will call them high, medium, and low mitigation sub scenarios. Uh, we have a 20 kilometer resolution, and this is uh, one objective of a downscaling experiment. If you can remember from Mr. Stock, where he mentioned about two degrees resolution, which roughly corresponds, let's say to 200 kilometer. So now we are downscaling from 200 to 20 kilometer resolution, which gives us a better picture of, or a detailed picture of the distribution of sources and transport and, uh, and, and, and the chemistry. Uh, we also use the uh, uh, fire uh, emissions that Risto uh, has just mentioned, developed in exhaustion project and the boundary conditions uh, uh, from the global simulations that Risto has mentioned. So how good are the models? I won't spend too much time, but the, the top figure shows uh, in blue, the model and red, the observations in, in Europe. And you can uh, generally generalize, you can say that the a model is doing on 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 at least on monthly means uh, a very a very good job uh, closely following the observed ozone concentrations uh, we have a high uh, correlation coefficients about 0 0.68 and a very low high bias about 1% this is this is quite uh, normal in 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 in, in, in such scales. Um, but when you look at uh, the, the, the geographical distribution, of course, uh, you see a different picture. Some, some locations are, the model is doing good. Some locations are, the, the model is doing bad, um, in, both in terms of correlation and, and, and bias. So I won't go through all of this. You can uh, ask if you have specific questions. And a similar figure for PM 2.5 here, the model is doing uh, slightly worse compared to ozone. And that's also typical in, in, in chemistry transport models or regional models, uh, because the, the, the sources are much more um, um, uncertain. Uh, the, the emissions are much more uncertain compared to the case in, in, in ozone. Uh, so we get on, on average around 40% uh, 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 bias uh, or underestimation of them. Of the, of the observed concentrations in Europe. And then if you move to the projections, um, here I, I show both the historical because we use a 30 year period in historical period, we, the era five period as, as a baseline. Um, and then over that from 2015 to 2050, we do the 
projections. Um, here you can see in different colors, red is the high mitigation, blue is the uh, middle uh, mitigation, and uh, the, the orange is low mitigation. And you can easily see that if, if when you mitigate more, so you reduce more air pollution, then this over Europe can lead to up to 20% or more reduction in surface ozone concentrations, so which is the green one. You, you, can, you, you can see the decrease. That decrease is not really obvious in blue, the middle of the road as we still named it, or the medium uh, mitigation scenario. We still see a slight decrease, uh, but this is around 3% on average uh, by the end of uh, the uh, by the end of the simulation period, but we, we still see a decrease. Uh, and in the orange one, uh, SSP 370, the, the low mitigation, we see a slight increase. Uh, this, this is the land uh, mean concentrations of all, all Europe. So this, this is the European uh, land uh, projections. Um, and um, why I mentioned about multimodals is that here I present the CMIP-6 uh, for European scale. Uh, projections uh, for the same set of um, scenarios we can see uh, and uh, there are two messages here one is that uh, our projections fall within this uh, CMIP6 estimates which is good so we are not an outlier uh, the other thing is that the, the shades in this uh, figure tells you the variability from model to model uh, I can't remember exactly how many models that were used in CMIP-6 or IPCC report, but uh, you can see there is a high uh, variability. Uh, there's a big uh, area of shades when you look at the different projections. This is why we use a multimodal mean. So if you are using just one model that can maybe correspond to the very low or, or the very high part of the spread, and then you can have different interpretation of the results. If you just rely on results from one model, that's why. Uh, but when you get the median of all, all these models, you probably reduce the uncertainty in your projections. Um, then switching to Nordic ozone projections, um, we will see a similar picture, of course, as expected, uh, higher reductions in ozone if you have a high mitigation scenario around the same level as the European. Um, level at around 20% reduction in uh, high mitigation, 5% in, in medium mitigation, and a 4% decrease in, uh, in, um, in no mitigation scenario. Uh, and by Nordic here, we mean uh, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, so the, um, the continental uh, Nordic region. And uh, this is another way to look at the picture. Uh, instead of now looking at uh, uh, European means, we saw the spatial distribution, how things change in the future in the different scenarios. Here I compare 10 year averages of 2040 50 to uh, 2015 2020. Uh, so, uh, the, more or less the present day versus the mid -cent, mid of the century. So, of course, if you look at the scales, uh, the scales change drastically. High mitigation scenarios, you end up with uh, ozone uh, decreases by uh, up to 14 microgram meter cubes. So uh, this is a lot. Of course, when you go to the medium mitigation, you still see general decreases over the uh, continent, but you you see some increases in the emission hotspots, the the, the Benelux region and, and and Central Europe, the Po Valley region. These are known hotspots of pollution in in Europe. And when you go to low mitigation or with a limited mitigation, then you see almost an increase everywhere over over Europe. Uh, similar figure for PM 2.5 projections. You can easily see the large decrease in the historical uh, period. Uh, this is thanks to the uh, effective uh, mitigation strategies we followed in Europe, but also in globally. So one, one, one uh, message is that we, we are not expecting such large reductions in, in PM levels in, in the future. So you can see that even the most ambitious scenario or the high mitigation scenario SSP 126, even though on relative terms, it gives you an 80% reduction from present day to 2050, more or less. Uh, but when you look at it on this uh, scale, then this reduction is more or less uh, close to flat compared to the historical uh, changes in PM levels. So uh, if you go to the uh, medium 
scenario, then you get around up to 60% reductions over Europe and 40% uh, reductions in worst case scenario. So even worse, unlike ozone for PM, even in the worst case scenario, we still will see um, reductions in, in surface PM concentrations. Um, but again, these won't, be, these won't be as marginal as we have seen in the historical period, unfortunately. A uh, similar figure, I won't talk too much on that, but uh, compared to ozone, where we had seen that the models were all over uh, the place, now we have a more consistent big picture of the of IPCC models. The, the, the shades are not that thick this time, so models tend to agree uh, on, on the level of reductions in all different scenarios, and we are also following this quite well. And a similar picture for the Nordic projections, don't have to talk much about this, I guess. We, we see a little bit less reductions in all the scenarios because this is mainly the Nordic region is relatively clean compared to the rest of the Europe. So the, the emission reductions don't do as much as it does in the uh, continental Europe, especially the central and southern Europe. The Nordic re region is relatively much, much more cleaner. So you, you see less reductions, but we see still reductions. Um, and th this figure also tells the similar thing. Much of the reductions uh, we see happens in the central to southern Europe. The, the, the Nordics tend to stay more or less similar on an absolute level. So as conclusions, uh, we expect that the emissions over Europe are going to decrease. Uh, European and Nordic ozone and PM surface concentrations are expected to decrease up to 20% in ozone and 80 up to 80% in PM 2.5 in most of the scenarios, except for ozone, where the worst case scenarios leads to a slight uh, increase of ozone. But again, this is one model only. Uh, we will be more robust when we have more models into this. Uh, and then ozone levels are expected to increase mainly over the Southern Europe in all scenarios, and PM levels are expected to decrease in high mitigation scenarios, in particular over the Central Europe. And by this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ulash. I have a question for you as well. Uh, you refer to reduced emissions, and this is also where the projections uh, yeah, have decreased the emissions in different scenarios. But uh, how come the emissions are reduced and which sectors uh, from which sectors are the largest reductions? Yeah, uh, well, that, that, that's of course quite pollutant dependent, or as Rist also mentioned it, when, when we look at the CMIP emissions where we take the projections from, the largest reductions are in the energy sector, um, so uh, energy combustion, uh, and which is followed mainly by industry and uh, and residential combustion or heating. Uh, the, these are the three sectors that much of the reductions are expected, uh, at least when, when it comes to particulate matter. For uh, pollutants like NOx that we showed, uh, traffic is a main contributor, for example. So uh, switching to electric cars, of course, will, uh, will be a main, main achievement, at least on a European scale, you will have uh, uh, less reductions, but uh, it's mainly combustion processes that we expect to have these large, largest decreases. So energy and uh, um, one res residential heating mainly. Thank you. We will now move on to our next presenter, and uh, uh, Shilpa Rao. She is the researcher at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and she will present on health impacts of temperature change and air pollution and the results from Norway in the exhaustion project. Thank you, Gunnar, for that. Uh, I'll just share my presentation. So today I'll be talking about the health impacts of temperature changes uh, and air pollution and the results from Norway from the Exhaustion Project. And thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Um, it's a very cold day. As the Christian said, it's minus 13 degrees here in Oslo. I don't know what the temperature is in your locations, but I guess if you're in the Nordic countries, then it's also cold where you are. 
uh, but in any case, this topic is still of importance for us in Northern Europe because there have been relatively few studies that have examined the issue of uh, temperature and air pollution and the impacts on health in this part of Europe. Uh, and also the, the relatively high temperatures recently in uh, England and Canada, for example, have prompted fears that there could be similar episodes in, in the Nordic countries in the future. And so it's quite important still to study what the impacts of temperature changes here in the Nordic countries could be and what implications would that have for future policies. So in this presentation, I have three goals. I will talk about the status of cardiovascular and respiratory disorders in Europe and Norway and how air pollution and temperature affect this. What are the results from the exhaustion project with regards to the status of temperature and air pollution in heart and lung disease in Norway? And I basically look at mortality, as Kristen said, although the exhaustion project is quite wide and also includes hospital admissions, but in this presentation, I'll mainly be talking about the mortality results uh, and only for Norway, because we work with data from Norway, so I'll present results just for Norway, although the results could theoretically have similar implications for other Nordic uh, areas as well. And then finally, just a short slide on what implications these results have for policymakers. So CBD in Europe and Norway, as all of you are well aware, but I repeat it here, CBD is still a very big problem in the European region. It causes more than half of all the deaths. In Europe, CBD causes 46 times the number of deaths and 11 times the burden of disease when compared to infectious diseases. And research shows that men, especially men in the age group 20 to 64, in relatively low paid unskilled manual jobs have three times the risk of preterm uh, premature death related to CBD compared to people in managerial positions. And when one looks at Norway, the picture is relatively similar. We have about 200,000 patients who are admitted to hospital or receive outpatient treatment for CBD. About one fifth of the entire population lives today with established CBD or is at a high risk of getting the disease. And in the groups with lower education, there's a higher proportion who are affected by heart attacks than in groups with higher education. So CBD remains a big problem in Europe. Uh, what implications do, does temperature have for CBD? And this is quite important because in this project, we're looking at the implications of temperature and air pollution on CBD. And as you can see in this figure, uh, an increase in the body temperature is followed by an increase in heart rate and in respiratory rate. The heart has to beat faster and harder and requires more oxygen. And if people already have a cardiovascular disease, there may be a mismatch between the demand for oxygen and a reduced ability to deliver oxygen. And this could theoretically lead to a heart attack. Lung diseases are, are also, and you would have, of course, when you have cold temperatures, you have hypothermia. So that's another where the temperature goes down and the body is unable to cope with the decreased temperature. And this is particularly of concern for elderly people. And similarly, also with the, as I said, you also have respiratory disease that is associated with increased temperatures. You have heart-related lung damage, for example, in the form of edema or acute lung failure syndrome. Uh, and this could be another major cause of mortality uh, as well. And this is actually the second uh, largest, biggest cause of mortality and morbidity after heat waves. So what did we do in Norway? So in Norway, to, in order to investigate the effects of temperatures, we use three levels of analysis and exhaustion. The exhaustion project uses firstly, city level, uh, city level health analysis, so looking at temperature related excess mortality in cities. And we chose seven Norwegian cities for the analysis. Uh, we were also asked to look at the temperature related excess mortality in the municipalities in Norway. So we also did this at the commune or municipality level. I will not talk about those results in today's presentation, uh, but we also uh, have those results evaluated. We, will all, we also were asked to evaluate the temperature related mortality using cohort data. This is basically quite important because when you use the individual level cohort data, you have a cohort of people whom you're following and whom you can investigate what the effect of temperature is. And this is very important for the individual level vulnerability factors. And I'll come back to that in the presentation. Uh, we use temperature data from the Meteorological Institute of Norway. They have a detailed uh, grid of data, one kilometer level, which is available. So we downloaded this data. This goes back all the way to 1957, although we didn't do the health analysis that uh, so far back. We also have air pollution data, which is actually obtained from ULAS in this team. We got it from ULAS's team here. 
And this is also a quality data at the one kilometer resolution for no waste. So we model both temperature and evolution. For health data, we use both time series methods and cohort data. I will not talk about methods in this presentation as it would be too long, but you can contact me on the methods. We used a series of statistical methods, uh, but we used the cohort data in particular as the Kuno cohort that we use. The Kuno cohort has about 185,000 individuals. It includes a questionnaire about all the people, so the people's self report, their uh, health status, and other things about themselves. But the big advantage in all Nordic countries, I think, is the advantage of linking this kind of data to further registries. So we were able to link this data to several registries for the health analysis. This includes the cost of death registry, the national patient registry, the Norwegian control and payment of health reimbursement database, a number of registries, which would give us additional data about health data related to the participants in this analysis. We also used a number of effect modifiers, and I'm not going to go into the details, but this is an exhaustion related table that shows the contextual and the individual health modifiers that were used. For the city level, we used uh, you know, relatively broader indicators, uh, such as GDP, educational level, and um, uh, 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 urbanization and the green areas. Whereas for the cohort level, we had more individual data. So we could actually look at things like self-related stress levels, smoking, occupation, medication intake, all of which can be quite important when evaluating the health impacts of, of temperature. Uh, you see here a map for Norway, and you can see here that the temperatures in uh, the summer, uh, the temperatures in Norway in the summer average between three and 17 degrees, whereas the winter temperatures are between two to minus 17 degrees. But there is a great variation in the temperatures. You can see in the left panel of the figure. You can see the annual PM 2.5 concentrations in the, mid, in the middle panel. And you, there's not, uh, as we lost, it's already mentioned. And also, pristine PM 2.5 in general is going down. And in Norway, the levels are extremely low. And you can see the ozone concentrations are right down. And the ozone concentrations can be quite high depending on which time of the year they are measured. Now we go on to the results on health. And you can see here that you have the, this is for uh, all of uh, Europe. These are the results for Europe. And you can see here the all cause mortality, the cardiopulmonary mortality, the cardiovascular and the respiratory mortality. And you can see that the left, uh, the left side shows you the decrease, the cold related temperatures. And uh, uh, on the right side of the dotted line, you see the increase with heat. And you can see that all these causes of death increase as you have an increase in heat, but the cold related aspect is also quite important, and especially in the Nordic countries. I'll come back to that in the next figure. But you can see that with heat, we get a high incidence, for example, of respiratory mortality. And this is a general result for Europe from exhaustion. And if you go into Norway and you look, for example, at the city level analysis that I mentioned, you see similar results. You can see the cold in the blue lines and the red. Uh, the red line showing you the heat related effect and you can see an increasing effect of heat especially about 20 degrees centigrade and this you can see in all cities of Norway whatever the temperatures are you can see that as the temperature goes up there will be an increasing effect of heat related mortality and here you can see the results for at the city level and you can see this for all the cities that I mentioned earlier and you can see the impacts by extreme cold, moderate cold, moderate heat, and extreme heat, which are basically just divisions of the temperature distributions in Norway. And you can see that there's significant amount of deaths related to, uh, especially related to my cold at the moment, which is the major cause of death right now in the Nordic countries. Uh, but you can see some related deaths also due to moderate heat. Shilpa, your, Shilpa, your yes. sound is a bit uh, back and forth. Could you please speak close to the microphone? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, you can see that the mild cold is actually the major cause of heat. In, uh, mild cold is the major cause of mortality in uh, Norway. And this is the case, I think, in all Nordic countries. But you can see some heat-related deaths. These heat-related deaths are expected to go up in the future. You can also see we also did some analysis by age group and gender. I will not go into details, but you can see a much higher impact for higher age groups, so for the 75 plus and for the gender. Uh, you can see that females in general have a higher uh, risk of mortality uh, compared to men. Uh, although this, this can vary for the cold temperatures, you can see that sometimes the men have a higher risk 
uh, but in general, females have a much higher risk uh, of mortality with higher temperatures. And also with the senior age groups, uh, as I said earlier, older people have a higher risk uh, mortality. And here again, you can see the distribution of causes by uh, of deaths by cause and sex. And you can see women and men, and you can see that uh, there's quite a large fraction of women with mortality here. And since we're also talking about pollution, I just have one slide that talks about pollution. And this is again a figure for all of Europe, maybe not so clear to you, but you can see that Norway does have an increased effect of, uh, of ozone in particular. And you can see that this is particularly relevant for uh, uh, respiratory mortality. And you can see here in the figure, the high, medium, low levels that Kristen mentioned. And you can see that for Norway, that there, there's some effect of ozone already on respiratory mortality. So there is an interactive effect. We don't observe so, so much interaction for PM2.5, but for ozone, we have slightly more effect uh, modification. Uh, going on to the vulnerability factors, again, I don't have time, but you can see here different levels of, uh, of uh, education levels, for example. And you can see here that education levels can be quite important, especially for respiratory disease. And you can see for CPD, whether you have high, medium, or low education plays an important role. Uh, and, and employment is, again, an important factor, whether you are self-employed, unemployed, and the unemployed people generally tend to have a higher risk. Uh, from cold and heat related mortality and your ethnicity uh, is also quite important whether you're born in Norway or outside of Norway these factors do play a role in your capacity to cope for example with cold. Uh, we are still doing the analysis but we're also looking at other, other vulnerability factors like the green areas so we don't have any analysis but initial analysis done already in exhaustion shows that it could be an important factor uh, in Europe and we hope to test this further in Norway in the next year. And uh, we also did some cost analysis in this project. We also investigated what the costs of cardiopulmonary disease are. You can see that the total direct CPD costs are uh, uh, about 490 million. Uh, there was uh, more of a non-linear relationship between temperature exposure and hospital care costs uh, compared to primary care costs. And you can see that females have the lower costs. So this is also interesting. They have the higher burden of disease, but lower costs are also something we need to investigate further and also some decrease in costs for higher education levels. But this is still an ongoing topic of research for us. Um, so why are these results important? Looking at the historical data is quite important as the previous speakers have also pointed, pointed out. In the future, there's supposed to be a huge increase in temperatures in Europe. And you can see here the temperature increases in Norway with the red and the green lines. And these increases in temperature will be very important to evaluate what these could mean for health impacts. So doing the historical analysis allows us to project the mortality burden forward, something also we plan to do in the project in the next year. And why is this important from a policy point of view? From a policy point of view, and especially from a public health sector point of view, you have here the 10 uh, duties of the public sector and what they are supposed to do. And if one translates this into climate change, then you can see that uh, there's a huge you know, role for the public health uh, officials and also with the policy people related to public health in trying to understand how these duties can be adequately uh, mapped on the climate change. So important things are public health partnerships, informing the policy informing the public about health impacts of climate change, looking at climate services, very important. There are a number of examples of where uh, we lost your sound again. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, please uh, also, uh, yeah, there's uh, 20 seconds left. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so there's an uh, important role for policymakers uh, for this topic. So to conclude, my conclusions are that cold-related effects still dominate in Norway, and I guess in all Nordic countries, but there is an increasing need to explore heat-related effects in the future. We see that the effects are more pronounced in cities and affect older populations and women. Respiratory effects are of particularly of relevance, and this we found throughout the exhaustion project. Number of factors play a role in determining vulnerability to temperature. So we see that education, employment, and ethnicity, those are the examples I gave you here, but we explored a number of other factors. So these could be quite important in determining vulnerability. And there's an increasing need for better knowledge to public health institutions, improved linkages at urban scales and climate health surveillance and reporting systems. 
uh, in all Nordic countries to cope with the trends of changes in temperatures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shilpa. Uh, we have a question in the chat, which I think is uh, relevant for your presentation. Uh, you touched upon it, but maybe also other in the panel uh, would like to add. Um, the question is, the economist claims cold temperatures are deadlier than hot ones in Europe. And what is the net mortality impact from a 1.5 degree increase? We have not actually calculated the 1.5 degrees. So this is actually a topic for future research. Uh, but maybe I can go back to my slide. But in my slide, I showed you the red and the green lines. And the green lines was not a 1.5. It was closer to a 4 degrees temperature. And you can see that it's quite difficult to you know, actually predict what the economic impacts would be. But I would say there would be a decrease in coal-related deaths and an increase in heat-related deaths, especially after 2050, also in the Nordic countries. So this would mean then an increased burden from heat-related diseases. But yes, the current burden does come mainly from coal-related deaths in Northern Europe. Thank you. We will move on to our last presenter, but not least. Uh, Katrine tronberg forsaka is a disaster geographer by background and has worked with preparedness and climate both in Norway and abroad. After several years at the UN, she is now a senior advisor for climate analysis at the Norwegian Red Cross. Please go ahead, Katrina. And uh, also just a reminder to the audience that you can, uh, it's very uh, appreciated if you ask questions in the chat, in the Q&A. Hello everyone, and thank you for having me on. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the um, Red Cross experience with extreme temperature preparedness and try to draw out some of the uh, lessons for action in the Nordic countries. I will be speaking primarily off of examples from responses and preparedness for heat waves, but a lot of these are also applicable to cold temperatures. So just to, to very quickly say, why, why is this something that the Red Cross cares about? Well, our national societies, of which there are 192, are auxiliaries to the government in a number of humanitarian issues. Although what we do in different countries vary, in general, we do work on disaster management and first aid in most countries. We do work on health and care services in most countries. And we try to do so in an inclusive and participatory manner because we are a volunteer-based local organization. And considering the vulnerability factors related to, uh, to age, to health status, to employment, to ethnicity, as well as other factors that have been highlighted earlier on here, we see that heat, is going to be one of our biggest areas where we can make a difference in terms of preventing loss in life of health in the context of climate change. So I will give a couple of examples in particular from how national societies of the Red Cross work in Europe on uh, heat preparedness planning as well as responses. So the first example that I want to mention that I think is important for us in the Nordic countries to learn from is the British Red Cross Resilience Program. It is a program that is implemented in various British cities, and it includes different um, groups in a participatory way of uh, planning for preparedness. So it facilitates dialogue between local authorities, emergency services, and organizations. It also trains community advocates in order for more people in the local community to speak up about the disaster and temperature risks that they see, not just the highly educated majority language speaking people. In terms of heat in particular, uh, the community resilience program helps local communities map heat islands, particular areas where a lack of green spaces or very dense uh, building mass uh, raises um, temperatures with attendant heat, of, heat effects on the people living there. And I think the thing that we in the Nordic countries can learn from this program is to look beyond the civil protection mode of preparedness planning. 
As mentioned, I'm a disaster geographer and for a long time I worked abroad. And one thing that came back again and again in the context where I worked, Nepal, Bangladesh, was the necessity of a participatory approach, which acknowledged that some people in the community are more vulnerable than others. Returning back home to Norway, what I realized is that the civil protection mode that we tend to use here when we plan for crisis has an inherent assumption that everybody is able-bodied, everybody is middle-class, and everybody has the same ability to communicate or to um, take in new information. Often we do not account for differences in health status, differences in cognitive functioning, or differences in socioeconomic status, such as where we live or um, how small our apartments are. So we should look to this British program and see, well, how can we make our planning for extreme temperatures more inclusive? How can we make sure that we are actually consulting with the people most at risk to figure out, well, what do they need from the health services as well as disaster management agencies? As an extension of that, of course, in, in many European countries, they have taken on board the lesson that especially elderly people are particularly vulnerable during heat waves. So in the Netherlands and Luxembourg, the Red Cross National Societies have particular activities addressing the risk of, of this group. That includes door-to-door -door campaigns, doing wellness checks and giving advice, uh, but also more targeted scheduled home visits to particularly vulnerable people with extra visits taking place during heat waves. And in terms of, of the lesson to be learned from this, I think that we in the Nordic countries need to work to ensure that health administrators, professionals and assistants, as well as others working with particularly vulnerable populations are aware of which of their agents or beneficiaries are at heightened risks what the symptoms of hypothermia or hyperthermia are, and that they receive an alert when they actually need to start looking for those signs. And I mention here in particular health administrators as well as the professionals, because of course the health administrators are the ones who are going to have to make sure that there are preparedness plans in place. We cannot place the responsibility of looking for these health impacts on the shoulders of every single health worker. There needs to be mechanisms in place to make sure that services and institutions, including the services that provide health care in the home, are actually ready for this. I also want to mention, because as I said, we have a lot of services that work with people who are chronically ill or the elderly, and often we hear the human resources aren't there. I want to mention an example from the Spanish Red Cross where they have a phone information campaign and follow-up systems in the summer to make sure that people who are at particular risk but who live in remote areas can actually be checked up on. Between July and September, they have a system where enrolled uh, people and patients get a phone conversation three times in the course of the summer. That phone conversation is done by a volunteer following a script. The script makes sure that the conversation assesses the health of the vulnerable person, assesses their knowledge of whether um, of what to do if they start feeling uh, extreme heat related symptoms. And it provides information if they do not know that. It particularly targets the provinces facing the highest temperatures. And I think for the Nordic countries, we need to then consider how technology can actually compensate for human resource gaps, particularly in health and the home services, because our periods of extreme temperature events tend to coincide with the times where our very strong vacation and holiday culture means that our health systems are often understaffed. Um, during the summer, it is the hardest to get well-trained health professionals, uh, enough of them to staff, say, nursing homes, as well as homes for chronically ill patients, as well as getting that help into the home. So we need to look at, okay, what can we do to actually compensate? And how can we also activate that during periods of extreme cold? 
Considering those human resource gaps, I also want to highlight examples where local volunteers are involved to increase the reach of government uh, and health service activities. In the cases of both France and Northern Macedo North Macedonia, the Red Cross supplies help to do practical activities during this period. Some of that includes wellness checks that I have already mentioned, but extend that not just to chronically ill and elderly people, but for example, homeless people and others who are sleeping rough. They also include a distribution of drinking water to reach a larger segment of the population, um, manning a crisis hotline for people who do not want, know what to do to cope with these temperatures, as well as running cooling centers. And we see that some of these tasks may be familiar to our more homely Red Cross societies as well, although we may be doing them during periods of extreme cold. For example, where um, electricity cuts coincide with winter temperatures, local Red Cross branches often help uh, providing uh, wood for the fire and visiting elderly people and others who live remotely. But in general, I do want to stress that when we are now dealing with new risks related to high temperatures, we need to continue to build on that strong tradition of volunteer work in the Nordic countries, not just to strengthen preparedness, but also to make sure that all of these other activities that we talk about, understanding vulnerability, involving people at risk can actually be done. Um, already in the course of this project, we have done some, some common and joint activities already. And we've been lucky enough that uh, some of the patient organizations working with cardiopulmonary disease have joined. And that is an important channel in order to increase awareness and spread knowledge to the people um, who are actually most likely to be affected themselves. I mentioned cooling centers. Uh, these can be run by government or as in the case of Austria, they have been run by uh, the Austrian Red Cross. A cooling center is an air conditioned area where anyone can come to cool down during heat waves. That doesn't cost you anything. You know, if you go to a cinema to cool down, you have to pay a ticket. If you hang around in shops, often there's an expectation that you, that you spend money. And similarly in a restaurant, you have to pay for your meal. These centers are free of charge and people can cool down, rest, nap, get drinking water or get information about what's going on. In the summer, the Austrian Red Cross Cooling Center in Vienna has approximately 40 visitors per day when it is open. It is only available during the warmest months. It is activated as a cooling center when temperatures go above 30 degrees um, for three days when the forecast says it will. The rest of the time, it tends to function as a blood bank. And this space is within a mall. It is in a place that people um, will be in anyway. It is easy for them to find it. And I think that the learning for us here in the Nordic countries is not just to work with commercial actors to make spaces accessible in renting them. That is a, that's a very high cost for something that isn't yet a, a huge issue, especially when it comes to heat. But there is room, for example, to speak with, um, with mall administrators as well as mall security services and you know, make them aware that, hey, a lot of people might be hanging out here now, a lot of young people, a lot of elderly people, a lot of people who may be homeless because they are seeking more comfortable temperatures. You need to be aware that these people should not be harassed or thrown out, but you should understand that they need this temperature right now. And similarly, we can work with public institutions such as libraries to make sure that their spaces are welcoming during extreme weather events. Finally, a lot of, a lot of can be done by making sure that people are aware themselves. The British Red Cross has worked a lot on spreading awareness on heat related risk and what to do to pre pre protect yourself against it in the UK. Um, they have done this in response to the fact that two in five UK adults say they've never seen information on how to protect themselves during a heat wave. It made me curious what, what is the same, what is the status in Norway? And so like the British Red Cross, we the Norwegian Red Cross commissioned a commercial uh, opinion uh, survey um, company 
to ask the same question in Norway to about a thousand Norwegian adults. We found that every second Norwegian adult say they've never seen information on how to protect themselves during a heat wave. We have a lot of advice that's well known in Norway on how to protect yourself during winter, but this new and rising risk, we do not have the inbuilt cultural memory of how to deal with necessarily. So finally, the concluding lesson we have to take is that we need to work together to ensure that we have preparedness and mechanisms for early action that are evidence-based. Knowledge is everything for humanitarians and disaster managers. We need to know what impacts do we plan to mitigate? Who is most at risk? Where do we need to be ready to act? When do we act? Who can help? And what advice do we give? So finally, we need to continue working together, research scientists, meteorologists, health practitioners, disaster preparedness agencies and volunteer organizations to make sure that we have a common understanding of the localized risk and that we have mechanisms to act early when we need to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katrina. And thank you to all the presenters for very good presentations. And now we will, uh, we have time for uh, questions and you can ask uh, questions live as well. But um, I think uh, Katrina and Shilpa, you touched upon the vulnerable groups in society. And Shilpa, you mentioned educational level as one vulnerability factor, but could you say a bit more about the implications your the results have for vulnerable groups in society? Oh, you are muted, Shilpa. Mm -hmm. That's actually something we are just working on, looking at how to design adaptation strategies that could target the vulnerable. And I think uh, that was also mentioned in Catherine's presentation. You know, So these kind of warnings need to reach the most vulnerable populations. And it's not quite clear on how you identify these populations and how you deliver warnings to them. And I think examples, for example, are outdoor workers who work outside, uh, for example, who should get sufficient warnings, you know, but with People who are unemployed and uh, you know are wandering the streets, it's very difficult to give them this kind of advice. I think there's a lot of work that needs to go into this kind of condition warning systems that you can deliver to the elderly, to people who need them, uh, you know, who are in need of them, and so on. Anyone who would like to add? May I add something? Yes, please. Uh, Shilpa mentioned that outdoor workers are at particular risk, and that is certainly true. But this is also the place where we need to start looking at national and cultural factors that may affect who is additionally at risk. Outdoor workers are at risk because they are out in the sunlight. They are doing heavy physical work. Now, this may be my Red Cross hat coming on. But in the Red Cross, a lot of our work has to do with making sure that people are moving around in nature safely. And looking at Norway in particular, for example, we have a very strong culture of people going hiking in the mountains during summer in places where there, are, where there is no shade and where often they are hiking long distances with a heavy pack all day. So we then also need to look at, okay, they, are, they have chosen to be there themselves they don't need to be there for their income, but it is a very strong part of national culture in very places, meaning that you have people who are vulnerable to hyperthermia for um, not employment reasons, but because this is something that, you know, we built in. It's safe to be in the mountains in summer because we have a, we have a good temperature and you don't get a storm. You don't have to bring a shovel to, to dig into the snow. So in developing advice for Norwegians on how to handle extreme heat, we need to think, okay, the elderly, people suffering from cardiovascular disease, outdoor workers, but also that guy who takes a 20 kilo backpack and is going to walk eight hours in the sunlight today. So very good example of how we need to adapt the advices to different cultural contexts. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the chat as well. Um, the question is, could research focusing solely on the effects of either cold or heat on disease and premature death lead to biased 
GWP risk perceptions in the general public. Anyone wants to answer that? Could you repeat the question? Now I didn't hear what you said. Yes. Could research focusing solely on the effects of either cold or heat on disease and premature death lead to bias uh, GDP risk perceptions in the general public? GDP? Is that what you said? GDP? Global yeah. warming potential. GWP. Yeah. May I just comment on the question? I mean, this is, uh, yeah. um, there's, uh, it's important that we focus on both par parts of this uh, exposure response curve. So we, um, I think uh, Svein was also the one who uh, who uh, mentioned this uh, study in The Economist, which is talking about the cold side of the exposure response function. And um, just to mention that it's interesting to, if you look at the details there, uh, people in hotter countries, even in Europe, are more sensitive, more vulnerable to cold stress um than uh, further north uh, where, where we are used to the cold and the uh, preliminary results from exhaustion also shows that uh, people who are vulnerable to cold stress are also the, uh, the ones who are uh, vulnerable to heat stress so it's basically this is about vulnerable groups who are more uh, sensitive to uh, different kinds of stressors because of uh, several reasons but back to your question about um uh, what to focus. Um, uh, most of the studies actually uh, so far, uh, like the Global Burden of Disease study, a large study on uh, risk factors, they do actually focus on, they do address both the cold and the hot side uh, of, uh, of heat stress or cold stress. Um, so it's, um, but uh, maybe there's a tendency that when we speak about global warming, or of course, when we speak about global warming, we are worried about the hot side. And many of the studies show that the, the, um, the increase in risk is actually much more rapid on the hot side than on the cold side. So that's also uh, one thing to take into consideration. But it's, um, um, and then the, of course there's a global uh, issue here because uh, even though total globally, there are more cold deaths than heat deaths, uh, the situation is quite different if you go to different regions. So the, typically the hot regions in the global south uh, there, there are more uh, hot deaths or heat stress deaths than cold deaths. So this is uh, this is a question that we have to address as it is now, but also taking into consideration what we expect of changes uh, uh, due to global warming. So that's of course uh, an important motivation for this exhaustion study. Can I say something just to add to Kristen's comment? I think what Kristen said it's very important. You need both the cold and the heat related deaths. And I tried to show that in my presentation that at the moment it's the cold related deaths that dominate. And because of that, of course, any effect on GDP would be mainly due to the cold related deaths. But you can see also with the projections that maybe after 2050, we start seeing an increase in heat related deaths, for example, in Norway. So in general, one, one needs to take both uh, into account when talking about the total economic burden. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I see that uh, we have a raised hand and we also have some questions in the chat, but we will send out uh, the uh, webinar and the presentations to all who have uh, uh, registered for the seminar. So I would uh, urge the presenters to type questions to the questions and uh, uh, so that these will be answered as well. But thank you so much for your attendance and for the presentations and uh, welcome back to the next uh, webinar we will organize in 2023 uh, within the framework of exhaustion and so thank you so much and have a nice weekend to all of you thank you thank you bye-bye bye-bye Merry Christmas to everyone. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.